Um, and thanks very much for joining us for our first online seminar as part of the ongoing ANU China seminar series for 2020. Uh, it is the middle of Reconciliation Week, so I think it's particularly important this week to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're all sitting on today, wherever we are. Uh, I, I think we still have a long way to go for full reconciliation of what I, and I also hope a large and growing number of other Australians acknowledge, and that is that this was and always will be Aboriginal land. So um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, to get the proceedings started. Now, this is our first online seminar. I've been taking place in quite a few myself, but I haven't been in charge of any. I'm not particularly good with technology, uh, but I certainly hope it, it runs smoothly for all of us. On that, uh, I think you probably do, and could I request that you mute your microphone so that we don't hear children knocking on the door and whatever else is going on in the houses that you're sitting in. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, we will have uh, about a 30 minute presentation and then Q&A followed at the end. Uh, we're recording the presentation and we'll make that available after today's seminar. Uh, but given that there are a whole bunch of questions that could come up and to give you the freedom to speak uh, about anything that you'd like to politely uh, ask the speaker at the end of it, we won't record the Q&A. Uh, if you go into your participation function, uh, which again, I'm hoping most of you are familiar with Zoom by now, but on participation, there will be an option to raise your hands. Uh, and there'll also, there's also a chat bar if you would rather than raise your hands, this is at the end of the talk, uh, you can instead write me what I'll treat as an anonymous question uh, into the chat room and then I'll share that uh, with Hongbo at the end of it. Uh, once we get started, Hongbo is going to share her screen with us. Um, and I've heard that if you're technologically more advanced than I am, that it's possible for you to doodle on that PowerPoint or write things on it. Uh, could I ask that you don't do that? So let me introduce Hongbo Ji. As I said, really thrilled that she agreed to be uh, the guinea pig uh, in taking this seminar series online for the first time. Uh, Hongbo is the country representative of the Asia Foundation. I'm not sure if you call that TAF Hongbo or, or TAF uh, mm -hmm. of the Beijing represented, re representative office. We are very lucky to have her currently visiting CIW on a TAF Australia ANU joint fellowship. And I think she's been had a very personal experience with COVID from the beginning. She was the first um, case, I think, that we had of, of someone who wanted to be in the country in January, but then has yet almost to, to step foot in, in the beautiful CIW building where we'd like to be meeting today, but of course are unable to. Uh, Hongbo has worked for the Foundation since 2007 and she's led programs in a range of fascinating areas, as you will have seen from her bio, uh, disaster management, women's empowerment, regional cooperation and also China-US relations. So she's obviously given a lot of thought to a range of topics and thinking particularly about how the Asia Foundation plays a role in that. And she's also had some diplomatic experience with the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and I noted, you know, that included a stint at the United Nations in New York. Uh, and you definitely wouldn't want to be there right now, but what a great place to have an opportunity to work at at some stage in your life. Uh, today, Hongbo is going to talk about an international NGO's 40 years in China. So it's quite a lot of time to cover in about 30 minutes. And without further ado, I'll pass over to Hongbo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jane, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really happy uh, to have this opportunity to be hosted uh, at uh, CIW and also um, you know, to be your guinea pig, to be the first uh, speaker on, uh, uh, on this uh, China seminar series. Uh, so I'm sharing the screen right now. Okay. 
Um, so this is indeed very unusual times, uh, uh, but I think it's also a good time to be doing more reading, more reflection, and going deeper into facts and, and, and issues rather than, you know, a lot of times we're surrounded by so much uh, noises. Uh, I think it's also good that technology is changing our lives, uh, how we work, how we connect, and has enabled us to be able to do this online sharing. Um, so for today's talk, I'll be talking uh, very briefly, uh, beginning with a brief introduction of the Asia Foundation, and then uh, more importantly, I'll talk about the Foundation's uh, history in China, especially our legal status, how that has evolved in the past 40 years, like, you know, the experience of many other international NGOs. Um, I'll then talk about uh, the programs that we've been doing over the past 40 years. Uh, of course, I cannot cover all. Um, I'll pick a few signature programs to show how our programming has really evolved as China has gone through its reform and open, opening up and the tremendous amount of changes over the past uh, 40 years. Um, and then I'll end with some uh, reflections on our values and approaches. Um, so for the Asia Foundation, as some of you may know, we were founded in 1954. Um, the headquarters is in San Francisco. We have an office in Washington, D.C. Uh, but the majority of uh, what the foundation does uh, really happens uh, in the 18 Asian co uh, country offices. We're all the way from Mongolia to Afghanistan, uh, almost everywhere in Southeast Asia and uh, South Asia. So for the entire Asia Foundation, these are our uh, program uh, focuses. Um, uh, governance is bread and butter of the, what the Asia Foundation does. We also have a longstanding women's empowerment and gender equality program, um, economic development, uh, environment resilience, uh, international cooperation and regional cooperation. Um, and uh, these th thematic areas are uh, not siloed. Uh, we try very hard to work, work across teams and offices. Uh, for example, women's economic empowerment uh, is a strong pr uh, programming area in many country offices, and we take a governance approach to almost everything that we do. So then quickly to um, Asia Foundation's uh, China office. Uh, we began programming in China uh, in late 1979. And as you, I'm sure you know, this is when reform and opening up only uh, got started. Um, the first thing that we did uh, in China was to uh, help facilitate the participation of a few American computer scientists to uh, attend the first international computer science conference in China that happened in September 1979. Um, then we did, you know, remote programming for almost uh, 15 years. In 1994, we opened our Beijing office. Um, the staff size um, was very small at that time. Uh, but it's worth noting that uh, when we opened our office, we were already in uh, the Hansen Center, you know, one of the early uh, office buildings that were open to foreign businesses. And we're still in Henderson Center uh, right now. Uh, there was no legal framework at that time for international NGOs. So um, we, uh, most of the time, we report what we, uh, we reported what we did to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, 2004, um, the regulation on foundations uh, uh, was released, and there's an article on, uh, in the regulation on foundations on foreign foundations saying that, uh, you know, you need to find a sponsoring agency and then you seek uh, legal registration with Ministry of Civil Affairs. Uh, but under that uh, legal framework, despite the lots of attempts that we made, we were not able to find a sponsor when we were not able to receive legal registration. It's worth noting that under that legal, uh, legal framework, only 28 international NGOs, you know, the likes of the World Economic Forum, Gates Foundation, um, with a total of 28 uh, received this registration. Then come 2016, uh, there's the very famous law on the management of international NGOs on mainland China. And, um, you know, the legal framework, um, I think was, you know, 
uh, dramatically uh, strengthened. According to the law, um, you still need to find a sponsoring agency, um, and it's what's called professional supervisory unit, and you seek re registration with the public security authorities. So registration was switched from civil affairs to public security. And uh, 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 a list of PSUs was uh, released, uh, but it's still very difficult. You know, nobody, no government organization, even after they have been listed on the list, wanted to be taking this type of uh, responsibility. Um, so I was checking today on the Ministry of Public Security website. Um, so to date, a total of uh, 542 international NGOs have received registration under this new uh, legal framework. But about half of that, um, if you look very closely, you notice that these are industry associations. You know, the, 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 the dairy uh, farmers, the dairy association, the potato association, that sort of organizations. So for us, uh, we were able to uh, secure a sponsorship from, from the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Um, uh, and we received our legal registration in 2000, June of 2017. So after uh, those many years, finally uh, in 2017, uh, we have a certificate that we can um, put in our safe. Um, so then in terms of our programming, um, you know, what we've done in the past 40 years, uh, like I said, I'll give a few uh, examples, starting with a few very long standing uh, programs. Uh, this is Books for Asia. Uh, Books for Asia is a, a program for the entire Asia Foundation. We send brand new books to um, Asian countries where uh, we work, uh, including to uh, Fiji, uh, for example, through the US Embassy. In China, uh, the Brooks for Asia program started in uh, 1987. Uh, and over the years, uh, we've sent over 3 million books to over 700 uh, universities in China. So mostly we send new textbooks uh, for higher education, um, mostly on you know, natural uh, sciences. So if we go to Chinese universities, some universities would have a reading room dedicated to books donated by the Asia Foundation. And on the books you'll find uh, this, uh, in the picture you'll see the uh, stamps. Um, this uh, program I think has played a very important role, especially as you can imagine in the early days, uh, original English language material uh, was very uh, hard to find uh, in China. So when, uh, after I joined the foundation, I, when my meetings with Chinese scholars, oftentimes I would meet people who would say, oh, you're from the Asia Foundation. I read books from the Asia Foundation when I was in college. So it, it really played a very important role. And then, um, you know, in more recent years, the number of uh, book donations uh, to China has decreased. And this is mainly because, um, you know, we received the books from the big publishers and they see China more and more as a, a market. So they, would, they, they don't want to be do donating to China anymore. And our focus has shifted mostly to uh, Western China, the less developed uh, universities. Um, this is another very long standing program of the foundation called Young Diplomats Program. And this program with, we've been sending uh, young Chinese diplomats from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to uh, very prestigious universities in the U.S., including uh, mostly Fletcher and, and size of Johns Hopkins, to get a one-year master's degree in international relations. Uh, this program started as early as 1980 and it ended in 2014. So over the years, we've sent a total of 96 diplomats uh, to uh, these programs. Um, some notable uh, uh, alumni from the program, um, you know, the two of the probably the most famous uh, current ambassadors, Chinese ambassador to the U.S., Ambassador Sui Kim Kai, uh, uh, joined the program uh, very early and he went to size. And Ambassador Liu Xiaoming to the U.K. Uh, 
uh, went to Fletcher. Um, this is a very um, important program, I think, also, especially in the early days when there was very little opportunity for Chinese diplomats to be exposed to you know, the, the American society um, and uh, to be able to debate uh, diplomatic issues, international relations issues with their peers and uh, on campus uh, in the United States. And those schools also told us that they had benefited tremendously uh, from having Chinese diplomatic, uh, diplomats in their classrooms. We also combine uh, the program with uh, visits, uh, you know, after the end of the year, um, the, we organize uh, study visits for the diplomats, and this is a picture of them visiting the New York Times. Um, and in more recent years, we added a component of having their classmates coming to China, so that this is more of a two-way exchange uh, to um, you know, learn more about domestic issues in China that may influence Chinese uh, foreign policy. And the picture is uh, you know, those American graduate students going to uh, Shanxi to visit uh, the coal museum. They had to go uh, underground, actually. Um, then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, governance is really a uh, bread and butter of what the Asian Foundation uh, does. Um, in China, for many years, um, um, more than two decades, we worked on governance and especially administrative law issues. You know, this is um, issues related to administrative procedure, um, open government information, freedom of information, uh, public participation in rulemaking and policy making. Uh, and uh, we facilitated lots of exchanges with uh, from uh, between Chinese scholars and their, their American uh, counterparts, um, you know, helping to uh, draft provincial implementation guidelines of the open government information regulations that came out in 2008. Um, and this is what we call on the supply side, you know, the kind of uh, rights and freedoms that can be provided by government rules and regulations and laws. On the demand side, we also work very closely, uh, helped uh, uh, Chinese law schools to um, establish uh, administrative law clinics um, so that, you know, uh, uh, law students at Ch Chinese law schools can um, uh, help organize uh, public awareness campaigns on administrative, administrative law, uh, can provide legal, uh, legal aid and uh, uh, advice to um, uh, citizens. Um, you know, we organize debate contests, uh, moot courts uh, on administrative law, and, and a lot of these um, exchanges have resulted in uh, really long-lasting relationships between uh, Chinese uh, administrative law uh, practitioners uh, from the government, from the court system, uh, from the universities, the scholars, and their counterparts in you know, U.S., um, UK, Germany, uh, uh, Japan, uh, uh, South Korea, and, and also across, uh, we facilitated lots of exchange between mainland China and Taiwan as well on these uh, issues. Um, philanthropy and uh, charitable sector development, also very, very lo uh, long-term um, involvement and contribution uh, to this area. Uh, as you may recall, 1995 is the World um, Women's Conference, uh, UN's uh, World Women's Conference in Beijing, and there's a parallel NGO uh, conference in Huairo. And this was uh, almost, you know, to a lot of Chinese people, the first time that they heard about non-governmental organizations. Um, so for us, um, starting about 1997, 1998, uh, we uh, were helping to um, foster the development of Chinese, uh, China's own civil society and the development of NGOs. 1997, for example, we helped organize the first international uh, NGO conference in, uh, in China. Uh, together with uh, Tsinghua University. And in those years, we um, had lots of programs helping to build the capacity of NGOs, how to, you know, how to do financial management, internal governance, um, and also on the legal framework side for, long, for the longest time. Again, there was no legal framework. Uh, on, uh, there was very little legal framework on NGO development. 
uh, there's only a few uh, government regulations, and and then uh, you know after decades of uh, work, uh, including work from the Asia Foundation, uh, in 2016, you know, the charity law was finally uh, adopted and became effective. Um, in more recent years, again, this has changed to um, you know helping to build the capacity of Chinese foundations. So in the past uh, decade or so, there's a huge increase in the number of uh, and strength of Chinese domestic uh, 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 foundations. Uh, for example, in 2014, um, there's only around 3,000 Chinese foundations. Today, there's over 8,000. Chinese uh, foundations, including the likes of, you know, the, the Jack Ma Foundation and, and many others. So we uh, um, worked for the past five years or so to help these uh, foundations become more effective grant makers. So they are providing the funding, they're providing the support to uh, Chinese NGOs to help build this, uh, you know, uh, good ecosystem within China's uh, civil society. Um, gender equality and women's empowerment. Also, uh, we've worked in this area for many years. On the upper left side, you see, you know, uh, uh, migrant uh, women workers uh, working in uh, the coastal areas of, uh, of China. And this really was uh, our, um, you know, early programming in the women's empowerment area. Uh, seeing that these uh, migrant women workers uh, were going to the big cities, um, into the Po River Delta, Yangtze River Delta. Uh, so we provided lots of um, health training, uh, skill training, scholarship uh, programs, um, how help them integrate into the communities where they were living in the cities and overall wellness uh, programs. Uh, but then in the last 10 years, um, also, um, as you may have observed, um, you know, lots of factories are being relocated outside of China. And uh, uh, there's also a big wave of um, the, what was uh, the migrant uh, population uh, returning to second, third, fourth tier uh, cities in inland China closer to their hometowns. Um, so we um, uh, have transitioned uh, from the early programs to providing entrepreneurship training to these uh, returned migrant uh, uh, women workers. Um, on the lower uh, left side, you see, um, you know, one of the uh, trainees having a small um, shop um, operating um, after they've received our entrepreneurship uh, training. And then violence against women, also a, a very, very important issue that we've focused on in the past uh, 10 years, and also in 2016, uh, China's domestic violence law um, uh, became uh, effective also um, after a decade of uh, advocacy. And so we're now, um, you know, uh, helping to build the capacity of China's own civil society organizations so that more of them can provide more and better uh, services to uh, uh, domestic violence victims. We also, um, if you look at the lower right side, this is the first ever uh, study uh, that has been done on the impact of the domestic violence on the workplace uh, in China. And we're now using the study to help influence uh, employers and HR managers to so that they do something about domestic violence. And, and this is actually required by uh, China's domestic violence law. The, um, um, the last area of uh, programming uh, that I want to talk about is really um, our big focus right, in those days. Um, as you can imagine, you know, there's a, a huge amount of um, a rising uh, global influence for China in terms of Chinese aid. Um, you know, the picture on the right shows uh, the increase of China's aid in the last uh, less than 20 years and uh, the establishment of uh, the new aid agency, um, SICA, and also, you know, a tremendous amount of Chinese overseas investment uh, as uh, demonstrated by you know, Belt and Road Initiative and, and, and all that. So in this um, background, 
a lot of what we do now, more than half of what we do uh, these days, um, is really about looking at China's role in the region, uh, especially in Asia, given the Asia Foundation's uh, footprint and, and wide network uh, in the Asia region, and see how we can help uh, uh, improve uh, uh, the responsibility, the accountability, and transparency of, of uh, China's engagement uh, in, in the region. So, uh, first of all, we look at Chinese international development cooperation, uh, China's aid, um, and we do um, comparative analysis. Uh, for example, right now we're looking at Australia's um, aid experiences, the architecture, you know, how um, OSAID was folded into DFAT, uh, the, the role of foreign, foreign policy in aid, and all of these um, is meant to provide um, comparative understanding for Chinese uh, scholars and policymakers uh, and will provide will be providing policy recommendations uh, to the Chinese um, policymakers. On the lower uh, half of the slide you see that we've been doing a number of country specific analysis of Chinese aid and investment in a particular country in Asia. We started with Cambodia, we've covered Laos, Nepal, the Myanmar study is being finalized and we're currently doing uh, Timor-Leste and we're hoping to start uh, to do one in the Pacific as well. This is on the one hand helping to provide a greater information and greater transparency to what China's aid is doing in different countries. And also on the other hand, uh, we hope to uh, facilitate a greater understanding by the Chinese side of how their aid is being perceived by local communities and civil societies. So, so there is a big element of looking at local perspectives, getting local feedback and, and feeding that back into um, Chinese, Chinese policy making. Um, the second biggest uh, big area on uh, global engagement is on uh, Chinese overseas investment. And we look at um, environment, and a very big issue, an issue that China is often criticized on. And, and we currently have a project looking at China's infrastructure investment in the lower Mekong uh, and see how, um, you know, uh, greater environment social governance uh, standards can be uh, applied. Um, you know, lots of dialogues and uh, uh, comparative analysis uh, again uh, there. Uh, we also look at uh, gender issues related to Chinese overseas investment. Um, this is very much an extension of what we've been doing uh, domestically in China, but a lot of, uh, you know, Chinese factories are uh, being moved to Southeast Asia and South Asia. And we want to look at well, work with uh, Chinese uh, Textile Industry Association uh, to help um, build um, uh, models and uh, toolkits and um, so that these uh, Chinese uh, factory managers uh, in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, they have a better gender uh, lens when they're, um, you know, managing these uh, factories. Uh, community engagement, uh, again, a very um, prominent issue for Chinese overseas investment. Um, you know, when companies are uh, doing business in China, they're not used to having to consider too much uh, what the communities are concerned about. And their uh, Chinese companies are realizing that this is not the case in when they're doing uh, investment in other countries. So we have um, done, uh, together with Chinese partners, we developed a community uh, engagement uh, guidelines and community engagement manuals uh, for Chinese companies. And we're uh, doing uh, some training uh, of Chinese companies uh, on this. Also, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about BRI, um, but, um, you know, we think um, we have observed that, um, you know, what is lacking really is uh, at the granular level, uh, how BRI projects are actually being perceived. Uh, and and uh, by the local communities, um, you know whether uh, community consultation has been done, whether it has been done by the local uh, government uh, or by Chinese companies. So we started doing um, um, empirical uh, uh, research on uh, BRI project in a particular country. We would pick a project, 
uh, identify the stakeholders uh, in the local communities and do a survey uh, focus group discussions. And um, um, so we've done this uh, in Pakistan and Cambodia and we'll be rolling out in six other countries in Asia. Lastly, um, you know, if you talk about Chinese, um, you know, so-called soft diplomacy, um, you know, many of you may have observed that uh, you are seeing more and more uh, Chinese NGOs uh, playing a role internationally, you know, whether it's attending UN conferences as um, observers, especially in the realm of environment and uh, uh, climate change, or, you know, setting up offices to do long-term development work like the Asian Foundation coming to China 40 years ago. Or um, also when disasters uh, happen in other countries, there's a, you know, increasingly a number of Chinese NGOs who are uh, doing you know, search and rescue, uh, providing disaster uh, relief. So we've been helping um, NGO, Chinese NGOs better understand how they should operate internationally by developing uh, manuals on um, you know how to um, operate internationally and also country specific manuals we've developed a Nepal manual for Chinese NGOs um, and th these type of uh, manuals would include you know what are the legal issues that you need to think about if you want to open an office or the HR management labor issues local customs um, a list of Thing, do's and, and don'ts and things like that. Um, we also on uh, disaster um, uh, uh, response and humanitarian uh, response, we've also provided uh, lots of uh, training so that Chinese NGOs, when they go to a disaster area, they know how to plug themselves into the international humanitarian assistance uh, framework and system. So that's in a nutshell all our programs. Uh, now a brief reflection of um, you know what I think are important principles and, and values and uh, approaches. And these are not um, unique uh, to us in China or to the Asia Foundation. I think these are the fundamental values and, and, and principles that we as development organizations uh, should be. Um, uh, should be adhering to. Um, so, for example, a very deep respect for local um, context. Um, and and for, the, uh, for the Asian Foundation, you know, um, we, we don't come in uh, with predetermined agendas or predetermined uh, programming ideas or solutions. Um, I think it's, and we don't come in with a model. Uh, we come with uh, some expertise, but fundamentally, what we do in a particular country um, is really in response to uh, local needs. And, um, you know, there has to be, uh, you know, programs and ideas have to be inclusive. Our role is really to facilitate exchange and to facilitate understanding between the different views. Um, we need to be uh, neutral um, bridges to, to bring together scholars and practitioners who have different views. Uh, we have to be very agile in our thinking, you know, especially in this day and age, um, very often from design to implementation and in the process uh, of implementation, a lot of changes um, uh, happen. So we have to adapt and uh, adjust and we're all always constantly in discussion with our partners and donors to, to make adjustments. Um, there need to be trust and, and a very close partnership. Um, you know, we don't consider our relations uh, with uh, Chinese organizations a donor-grantee relationship. It's more a partner uh, partnership uh, relationship. If you go to the office, you'll hear our colleagues always talking about partner, our partner a and our partner B, uh, we, we, we don't really use the word grantee. Um, you know, we design programs uh, together, we implement programs together. Um, and I think this is uh, particularly important in the case um, of China because, you know, it's a huge country, right? Um, it doesn't matter how much uh, funding we can bring to this country, uh, it is a small job in the ocean. Uh, and, and we have to, you know, clearly uh, uh, very closely work with our local partner uh, to make sure that, you know, we are uh, facilitating the best um, exchange of ideas. We're helping to build uh, small models that may uh, be able to, um, to be uh, replicated. 
and long-term uh, presence and commitment on the ground. Uh, this is very, very important uh, for the Asia Foundation. You know, we've been working in Asia for 66 years from 1954. We've been in China for uh, 40 years. Um, uh, among our um, staff of around 800, uh, more than 700 are locally based uh, national staff. Uh, in all the Asian countries in the China office. Um, everybody, including myself, is a Chinese national. Uh, so this kind of, um, you know, uh, close relationship with the local uh, communities and, and long-term commitment uh, to local development is, um, is fundamental. So um, I hope um, this is um, this gives you an idea of what the Asia Foundation has been doing in China in the past uh, 40 years and how we've been adjusting ourselves to the changes uh, that have been happening in China. Um, I hope you can stay connected with the Asia Foundation. Um, everything on the left um, you can follow, uh, but um, I would encourage you to scan the barcode, uh, which is our um, Chinese language uh, WeChat uh, public account uh, that we are constantly pushing out, uh, we're using to constantly push out uh, Chinese language materials. Um, and especially now um, when so much of our focus is to build understanding between China and the BRI countries, we are uh, you know, publishing a lot of um, uh, information um, you know, Nepal, um, Myanmar, and hopefully this will be, you know, a source of good information and it'll help to improve understanding on the Chinese side of uh, their Asian neighbors. So that's, that's my talk on my presentation.